We have been studying the epistle of 1 John. Last week we covered the first 10 verses, some really awesome text in there. Today we're going to take on a little bit more. I want to go back just for two or three slides and give a reminder of what we covered and a little bit of an application maybe to tie together with what we're doing today. Where there is a standing practice of sin, there is no standing in the new birth relationship with God. One can be born again and ignore the, what God wants us to do, and we will have no standing in a relationship with him. We will not be walking in the light. We will not have that fellowship that we desire. If one continues to practice the practice of sin, it cancels out the fact that we were born again of the water and the spirit. Christians must remember that salvation is not an isolated event of the past. We need to think of this in a couple of ways. Number one, it happened in the past, but the effect is continual if we are walking in the light, if we are working to be righteous in relationship with God. Be faithful. This is the criteria. Not perfect. Be faithful unto death, unto the point of death. Literally, be faithful with a view unto a point in time in which you will die. You know, some, sometimes we, we shy away from that point, and I, I realize that the longer I live, the more is coming. But the, the encouragement part of this is be faithful unto death. I'll give you a crown of life, he says in the rest of the text. But to the rest of you, by the way, he writes in Revelation to the church of Thyatira, and he says, to the rest of you who do not hold to this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep, deep things of Satan. That is no different than what we're studying in our text in 1 John. There are people who placed an extreme value on knowledge. And he said, well, they, and they would say, but you don't understand all of this. You need to dig into the things about Satan. He says to this church who is struggling under persecution, I, I say to you, I do not lay on you any other burden, only hold fast to what you have until I come. The church didn't have a lot of strength. They didn't have a lot of ability, but he said, be faithful. Just, just hang on to what you've got until I come. For Christians, we must make an, a special, an extra special effort to keep frequent sin out of our lives. We all have things where sin wants to tempt us, and we know what those are. And we need to push back with all the power that we have and God gives us so that those sins don't become commonplace. Christ's mission was this, to remove the guilt of, of, of sin for believers and to remind them we need to keep our lives free of sin. Now, fellowship with God, this is some of what we've covered beginning in chapter 1. Fellowship of God, shall it? <laughs> Fellowship with God is rooted in the moral nature of God. Chapter 1, God is light, not a smidgen, not a speck of darkness. Fellowship with God is rooted in the established fact that Jesus really was a historical character and he really lived. And John is saying in chapter 1, we ate with him, we touched with him, we said, trust me, he is real. Fellowship is rooted in the obedience to God's commands. We won't do it perfectly, but we'll pull out all the stops to do it as well as we possibly can. It's rooted in the true knowledge about God and Satan. You know, we, we, sometimes I wonder if we take Satan serious enough. But we need to see that those are two extremes. God is all about good and Satan is all about evil. God is all about sat uh, saving. Satan is all about destruction. Fellowship is rooted in the apostolic epistemology. The study of 
what the, the apostles viewed of things near the end of time. Fellowship is rooted in the settled practice of righteousness. And today we're going to look at fellowship is rooted in the practice of sacrificial love. All right. I want to read this out of the Message Bible again. For this is the original message we heard. We should love each other. We must not be like Cain who joined the evil one and killed his brother. And why did he kill him? Because he was deep in the practice of evil while the acts of his brother were righteous. So don't be surprised, friends, when the world hates you. This has been going on for a long time. The way we know we've been transferred from death to life is that we love our brothers and sisters. Anyone who doesn't love is as good as dead. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer, and you know very well that eternal life and murder don't go together. This is how we've come to understand and experience love. Christ sacrificed his love for us. This is why we ought to live sacrificially for our fellow believers and not just for ourselves. All right, let's go back to the text and look at verse, the first verse today, verse 11. For this is the message we've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. The word message would probably take them back uh, in, in this context to chapter 2, to John's discussion of love. But if they knew something of Jesus, it would take them back further. A message you've heard from the beginning. John clearly, I believe, connects the practice of loving a brother to righteousness. Look at this. Whoever loves his brother abides. He stays in the light. Brotherly affection among God's people was fixed in stone by Christ as a way that his disciples can be identified from everyone else. This is really important, church. We're going to see in a moment how important it is. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Loving one another is not a new commandment. All right. But follow on. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. It's amazing in the context that the, the longer I live and the more that I read, maybe things stick for the first time. But he said, I want, you, I, want, I want you to live and I want you to love as I've loved you. That's a benefit to each one of us, to each other. Our love and devotion to each other. But not just that. He says, all people. He didn't say the brothers and sisters around you. He said, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. Which says what? The love that we have for each other. It's the kind of love that Christ had for us, and that stands way out in the world. The world can't help but not, not but notice that. This love, of course, is agape love. I'm going to define it for you in a moment, but first I want us to see it's not the kind of love that the vast majority of the world practices or even understands. You say, Jerry, are you sure? I'm absolutely positive. I don't, I don't know what the percentage is, but it's high. How, you, how do you know? Well, there's something going on in the Ukraine this week. What was it? Oh, yeah. There's an attack on the Ukraine. What motivates someone to send people, soldiers, to die on both sides, and civilians to die when no one's life is in jeopardy. You see, there's, there's a darkness about evil. We lived 15 years in the former Soviet Union. 
I always said to people, if you poke the bear, he will fight to the end. I don't know if that's true or not, but I know that's his nature. That's who he is. This isn't something that suddenly he decided. This nature has been progressing over a period of time. I'm not talking about politics. I'm talking about evil. <clears throat> Agape love seeks, we're going to define it now, seeks the highest good of others. Agape love will love regardless of the sacrifice or the cost that the sacrifice requires. It does so because... It's that kind of love. Agape love loves whether the one deserves it or not. Aren't you and I glad about that? <clears throat> Aren't you and I glad about that? Boy, am I glad. We don't deserve any of this. We don't deserve to be sitting together as brothers and sisters in a unique situation of love and, and care. We don't deserve one drop of it. We deserve death and total destruction. Love looks for an opportunity. Love looks for an opportunity. You ever think maybe you, we travel at such a speed in life, our activity in our brain, that we really don't look? Well, I don't always look for opportunities. Love loves regardless of how many times a loving act needs to be repeated. Is that good? That wasn't a rhetorical question. Thank you. It's good. Is that important? I mean, the disciples ask, you know, well, Lord, how many times should we love one another? Seven times? That's a, that's a good round Jewish number. And Jesus said, how about 70 times seven? You remember what they said, the response? Lord, increase our faith. Love loves regardless of how many times. Is that important to you? Is, is that important to how we treat each other? Is that important to how God views us? How many times do you think God has forgiven you? 70 times 7? Seven? 7? Love doesn't keep account of how many times. The words one another in the text are a reciprocating pronoun that defines a mutual obligation of love on the entire church. One another. I went through the Bible one time and I, I just started looking at how many times one another is used. And it's amazing. We could, we could sit here and read scriptures probably for a good hour. Just about one another. Evidently, the term brother is an extension of John's discussion about little children of God as he viewed them. Say with me. For the Greeks, a brother was one who came from the womb. Delphos womb. The Greek would look at you and say, are you a Greek? You're my brother. But you didn't come out of the same. Are you a Greek? And then you're my brother. Are you a Christian? Are you a disciple? Then you're my brother. So we're, view, we, we're to view each other that way. I like to dig in sometimes to how the words were originally used because we're not, I'm not fluent in Greek. First John, the figurative womb of the new birth is something that he just constantly interwines. But the figurative, or the figurative womb of the new birth is a common belief in Jesus. Look at this. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has what? Been born of God. Mutual love for brothers. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been what? Born of God and knows God. And finally, it's a general practice of righteousness. No one born of Christ makes a practice of sinning. We don't do that. Why? We died to sin. 
We don't want to sin. We want to be more like the Christ. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. I find it interesting that the Holy Spirit goes all the way back to Cain and uses him as an example. This is not the kind of love you want. He slew from the Hebrew is to strike with a deadly intent to butcher or slaughter. So he slew his brother Abel. Genesis chapter 4, verse 8 and verse 25. It was an intent. It was something given with prior thought. Maybe Cain is used as a contrast between Cain's motivation to kill Abel out of some horrible jealousy or in contrast to Christ dying for his brothers motivated by a love the kind of which the world has never seen. He may also be talking about a Gnostic sect called Apites. This was a group that was really satanic. You may be thinking, and it occurred to me at least, why would these brothers be tempted with satanic things? Well, I don't know where 1 John was written, but a lot of 1st, 2nd century people place the writing of John in Ephesus and that it was in the area of present-day Turkey that he wrote the letter. If that's the case, what environment did these people grow up in? I mean, Satan and satanic and ungodliness was part of their society. So when someone would present that, it would be easy for them to buy into it. And so this, this sect has a hero of the Garden of Eden story, and guess who that is? Well, if you're a satanic sect, the, the hero would be Satan. How weird is that? Because they place such a premium on knowledge. They accuse, they said, God, you cheated Adam and Eve because you didn't let them have the knowledge of the tree of, of good and evil. Like they couldn't read and find out what the knowledge of good and evil resulted in? There were so many Gnostic sects. So many that placed the premium. You see, the way out to ignore scripture and the way out to ignore teaching of the apostles was to simply say, well, yeah, but I've got this knowledge I've got up here. Man, you just won't believe what I got in my head. The Holy Spirit has John pose the question in the middle of verse 12. And why did Cain murder Abel? What was his motive? Stay with me. It appears from the text that Cain's jealousy was motivated over the fact that God blessed Abel. And that was the reason for the slaughter. Now stay with me. Jealousy isn't where it ended, but jealousy is where it began. In the last part of the verse, because his own deeds were evil, tell us that Cain was serving Satan. You know, it's not a, a full-blown meltdown or a temper tantrum that he's involved in. This is a settled lifestyle of Cain. I, I kind of remember growing up and people saying, well, we don't really know, you know, why it is that God chose Abel over Cain. Really? I mean, he is, a, a, Cain is an example of familiar wickedness. Abel is an example of standing in righteousness. Don't be surprised, brothers, when the world hates you. There's a, this is real important, there is a divine compulsory hostility between good and evil. 
Satan is present when God says, uh, Adam and Eve is... <laughs> Satan is present and Adam and Eve are there when God says this, I will put enmity, deep-seated mutual hatred. I'm going to put this between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. You know, I, I think sometimes growing up, I had this idea that they had a the little conversation. God said, you know, Satan, I really don't appreciate what you did. God said, no, I am going to put deep Mutual hatred between you and the woman. Stay with me. Why? God does not want good and evil to coexist. He doesn't want peaceful harmony. So he placed hostility between the two. And he wants us as his disciples to expect confrontation from those who are followers of Satan. You've heard this, seen this sticker, coexist. Are the real cutesy one? Even the world doesn't buy into the coexist. The Muslim would say, drive a stake through the heart of the whole idea. I mean, common sense would say good and evil doesn't get along. Cain is an everlasting example of the natural antagonism between good and evil. I want you to think about this, because back in chapter 1, remember, God is light. There is no tolerance or harmony between light and darkness. Light and darkness, uh, twilight before dark, and twilight in the morning is the difference. Mm, people don't see well. There's a battle going on. So God doesn't want confusion between those who would follow Satan those who would follow him. So he clarifies it from the very beginning. Harmony with evil blurs God's standards. Those who practice righteousness become the natural target of the world's hostilities. I heard a week or two on TV ago, somebody said, you know, it took me a while to figure this out, but I know, I know who was back behind the problem in January 6th at the Capitol. It was Christians. It just took me a while to figure it out. And when I heard it, I really wasn't surprised. I was just surprised that they didn't say it earlier. No surprise on, on who gets the blame. It's like in the Roman world. If something happened, blame it on the Christians. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light, and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. You think? <laughs> Are you kidding me? Evil will never stand in front of light to be revealed. It would be like standing in front of an x-ray machine and saying, phew, here it is. Evil hates light. Evil hates God. Evil hates the followers of God because they all... Hmm. They all represent light. Those of us over 50, I think, are sometimes surprised when Christians are attacked. You know, we grew up in a world that that didn't happen. Our, our forefathers left England and moved here. And one of the purposes was so that they could worship like they wanted. And a lot of us grew up in, in, a, in an environment like that. But I want us to think about it. It was never supposed to be harmony. We just thought everything was peaceful, right? We'd like for it to go back to the way it was. But it was never intended to be peaceful. We didn't understand the, the anger and the horrible mm, ugliness that sin was going to drop into our world, and it is only getting worse. I think as disciples of Christ, we shouldn't get all worked up about this. It's easy for me to do it. I did it one time and texted Larry, and Larry said, just simple words, keep the faith. See, that's what I need to be reminded of. Keep the faith. I, I need to understand the world will hate me. It should hate me. I shouldn't expect anything less. So if someone in the world is nice, they're faking it. It's not real. 
I'm not saying there aren't some kind people. But I'm saying those that serve Satan have no problem with blaming Christians. Jesus said, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. Are we in good company? Are we in good company? Yeah, we're in good company. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. It'd go, come on, baby, let's get together. But you're not of the world. I chose you out of it. Therefore, the world hates you. Maybe we need to put that on our refrigerator as a reminder. The world hates us. You look at what's happening in Ukraine. It's nothing but hatred gone to the other end of the world. I, I got text, I mean, communication with people from Russia. We're not for this. What's going on? We don't, we don't need any more land. My relatives are in the Ukraine. Blah, 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 blah. They're just going on. And I said, understand it's hatred. It's evil that causes these things. We know that we passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love is stuck in death. The Greek word literally means stepped over or stepped out of death into life. And once we've stepped over death, we remain in life. I am looking at people that are saved today. You're no more saved today than when you came out of the baptistry. You know a lot more, I, I hope so, than when you came out. I hope you're more mature. But you've stepped over to life. Be faithful. I pass from death to life as I think that's the best definition, maybe, of baptism. I realize the forgiveness of sin, but the reason I can step over death is because Jesus forgave my sin. What proof do I have? Death to life? The evidence that the transition has taken, is, has taken place is proof because we love the brothers. It's not heavy. It's not really big. It's hard to do. I mean, I'm not hard to love, but some of you are. I understand that. But he says... We're in the transition. In the Gospel of John, he describes those who have been a part of the new birth as those who hear my word and believe in the one who sent me. Jesus always pushes people back to think of God. The kind of person, look at this, has, that has eternal life will not be condemned. He's crossed over, just what I said, from death to life. For he's rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. What did he say at the transfiguration? Who, this is my son. Listen to him. Whoever does not love abides in death makes it clear that currently failing to love will result in present residence in spiritual death. Failing to love, and, and again, it's challenging. Failing to love the kind of love that Jesus exemplified through his entire ministry results in spiritual death. And you stay there. Once, once you get there where Cain is, it's really hard to get out. It's not impossible. To love not is to live not. I don't know where somebody said that. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know very well that eternal life and the murder don't go together. It couldn't be much clearer what hate is. Cain may again be brought into this thinking to establish that hate not only destroys the life of those who are hated, but it destroys the life of the one who is hating. I mean, the damage to other people is obvious, but the internal damage, huge. On the stage of hate, there's no ground for salvation. Because hate is the motive for murder. When I don't love 
as I should love. That's my motive. You say, but I'm not there. No, but if you stay there long enough, you'll get that. God told Cain before he killed Abel, he said, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must overrule it. Even in Cain's state of ungodliness and living for and leaning toward Satan, God said, let me remind you, sin is crouching at the door. You must rule over it. Did Cain have to kill Abel? Not according to the text. If you're going to stop that sin from reaching some point, whatever, you choose the sin in your life or something. If I'm going to stop it, I've got to stop it way early, the earlier on that I put the brakes on, the easier it is for me to stop it. In chapter 3, verse 14, love is the evidence of life. Chapter 3, verse 15, hate is the evidence of death. We're gonna, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. How can we understand this text? Stay with me if I'm lost you, because two or three slides and we're through, but this is important, I think. All of Jesus' life, he was a servant. He gave in everything from the moment he took on his ministry, the, the ministry at about age 30. For the next three and a half years, he gave himself in everything. In fact, at the supper, John chapter 13, he rose from supper. He laid aside his garments, taking a towel. He tied it around his waist. He poured water in the basin and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them on a towel. Who usually had that job? A servant. So how many servants were there, there they, that day and how many lords? I've said this before. Thirteen lords and one servant. The NIV says, showing them the full extent of his love. I had trouble with this for a long time. I thought death was the full extent of his love. Stay with me. He eats a Passover and he dies on the cross. But if you've given everything else in your life, if you've poured out your life to everybody around you, you've given everything and you shake it and there's, there's, there's only one, off, one drop left, what is that? That's less death. But I've been giving and giving and giving. If, if we gave to each other, well, let me go on. This is how we come to understand and experience love. Christ sacrificed his love for us. This is out of the message. This is why we ought to live sacrificially for our fellow brothers and not be just out for ourselves. Somehow I got to go back. All right. So while we are called to give our lives for our brothers, and we might be called to do that. If you and I have poured out our lives for our brothers sacrificially with the love of Christ to where there's not anything I can say to you or you can say to me that we would be sh shocked about, that I could talk to you about anything you could talk to me. We could have that kind of a relationship. If we've done that sacrificially, is the final act of love more difficult than fully serving in love sacrificially? I suggest to you, no. Do we have some loving to do? Do we have some relationships? Do, you know, we, by the way, we're having small groups. I need to announce this. If you're in Larry's group, 
Are we meeting or we don't know yet? Okay, if you're in Larry's group, you're meeting at our house tonight. My sister's got the Hubaglavas of the Statue or something. I don't know what she's got. But anyway, you're going to meet in my house. These, these groups that we've been meeting are amazing. I don't know how many, how, how many do we have, Wayne, at the group, your group last week? Fifteen. And there were about four or five out sick. And I loved it. I, I always felt like I was back home in Russia because, you know, there's... Wayne has this monster table. I mean, it's half as long as from here to the, to the end of the building. And usually you can set everybody around there, but you couldn't get half of us around it. We half were at the table and half were in the living room. And I thought, all I need is just some Rus Russian sitting up on the couch somewhere, and I'd be right at home. I mean, they had a little old teeny apartment, and they had a couch and a chair and a stool and, and a little table to put everything on. And you just reached over, and you just ate. And you got... And we weren't doing that by any means, but we were, we were having... A great time getting to know each other and talking and sharing a little bit about, you know, I, they, they look at me and I, I said, all I got to say on Sunday, don't look at me. If you want to get to know what we're like, if you want to get to know what we're made of, yeah, it takes an effort. I get it. But everything in life that is worthwhile takes an effort. If you're not in a group, find you a group. Find, we don't all, sometimes meet Sunday, sometimes during the week. Find time. If that group doesn't meet the time you can't, go join the other one. There's no law that says you can't go into another group. Just group. And learn the relationship that God intended. Because it's a whole lot easier for me to love you when I know you. You say, but you don't really know me. Well, maybe I don't want to know you that. I'm just kidding. We're through. If you're out of Christ, man, did Jesus give everything and leave everything so that we could be in a relationship with him, have fellowship with him every single day of our life with absolute certainty and consequence. We know that we're saved. No guessing. If you're out of a relationship with him, don't stay out. Get back in fellowship with Jesus. Get back in the light. The darkness, the gray area has nothing that you ultimately want. Our group discussed it last week and some said, yeah, I've been down that road and trust me, you don't want to go down the road. There's things you learn in the group. It's important. We're going to sing a song of invitation. If we can serve you some way, let us know while we stand and sing.